test, 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 Alrighty, welcome to another Hoopo stream. It is finally the day that we go over RWKV. So, RWKV, and I was reading this uh, Discord, or not this Discord, this uh, GitHub yesterday, and they have a very popular GitHub, but they have a specifically a sp a pronunciation guide here. It's pronounced ra Rockov. Rockov. I don't know. It's almost harder to pronounce that than it is to pronounce this, but. R W A K U V. R W A K U V. Kuv. R W A K U V. Rakuv. I don't know. <laughs> but I think this summary here is good. It's an RNN, which is a recurrent neural network, with a transformer level LLM performance. Uh, large language model, that's what LLM means, and then transformer refers to the fact that most of the LLMs you interact with are based around a transformer architecture. So the whole point of this uh, entire project is that they want to be able to have a LLM performance or they want to be able to have an LLM that is on par with uh, transformers but based on RNNs. So this repo is actually in incredibly crazy. Not only do they have uh, a Python via PyTorch implementation but they also have like a straight pure CUDA implementation. They have code for uh, a variety of quantizations, so floating point 32, floating point 16, all the way down to int 4, which is actually one of the more hardcore kind of quantizations. They also have LoRa fine-tuning, so they have a lot of different work here. This is not just a small little research group in some random university. This is a significant amount of people who have obviously been contributing for some time. They even have a Discord, too, that you can join. So, yeah, this is kind of the, the culmination of what seems to be years of work by a bunch of people. I think the main person here is this guy here, Bo Peng. I don't, I don't even know if it's a guy. It might be a girl. I'm un, 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 uncertain about that. But you can see this is what, what open source AI looks like. You have all kinds of different uh, universities all over the world. You have everything from Spanish universities in Barcelona. You have Chinese universities. You have California universities. You have uh, Oslo in Norway. You have uh, Rocklaw here. This is a Polish university. You have a, a bunch of different um, companies. You have Eleuther AI, which is kind of a staple of the open source AI community. And then all of this work, this RWKV, is all kind of part of the RWKV Foundation, which I think is basically a group that gets sponsored by uh, Eleuther and Stability AI. So somewhere up here they say it, but let me see. Uh, Eleuther Stability. Yeah, we have plenty of potential compute uh, thanks to Stability and Eleuther AI. So they're basically getting funded by Stable Diffusion and Eleuther AI, which is originally Connor Leahy's company, but I think he actually left that. So I don't know who. <laughs> Rookie V. I kind of like that. Rookie V. Yeah, it's kind of weird because they, the pronunciation guide is harder to pronounce than the actual acronym, so I don't know. I was watching a, a Karpathy stream, and he called a VIT, like a vision transformer. I've always called it VIT, but he called it a VIT, which was weird. So, you know, I think the programming and kind of like ML community, you're always going to be 
you're always going to have these weird uh, turf wars between how do you pronounce it, right? Everything from GIF to GIF, everything from JSON, SQL, SQL. Like, there's a lot of these acronyms that have different ways of pronouncing it, and people are uh, upset when people don't pronounce it the right way. But I think that's part of the fun. All right, so let's get to it. This is a very long paper, so I might be doing it a little bit fast, but we'll see. Chat jippity. <laughs> That's good. All right, 22 May 2023, so pretty recent here. I think today is the 25th, but again, this is work that's been uh, brewing for multiple years, so. Transformers have revolutionized almost all of natural, proce natural language processing, NLP. Can I get this a little bit bigger? There we go. Uh, but suffer from memory and computational complexity. So memory and computational complexity is basically uh, how long it's going to take and how big your computer needs to be in order to run something, run any kind of algorithm. And the problem with transformers is that they have a quadratic uh, scaling when it comes to the memory. So there's this kind of fundamental problem with transformers so people are trying to find all kinds of different solutions and one thing you can do is uh, resurrect a blast from the past called a recurrent neural network and this is something that was much more popular before but has kind of fallen out of practice um, so here they're bringing it back exhibit linear scaling in memory and computational requirements so linear scaling instead of quadratic scaling so you should be able to, in theory, have a much longer sequence. Uh, but struggle to match the same performance due to limitations in parallel parallelization and scalability. So part of the problem is that in an RNN fundamentally is kind of like an autoregressive kind of situation where it has to use its own output from the previous step in order to get the next step, right? So it needs to basically do everything in like one at a time versus transformers you can kind of like you can calculate the attention of the whole brick at the same time whenever you're doing transformers in uh inference mode you still have this issue but whenever you're uh training a transformer you can do the whole sequence in one big chunk which is not the case for recurrent neural networks when you do a recurrent neural network you need to do the this kind of like serial evaluation even in training mode we propose a weighted key, uh, we propose a novel model architecture, receptance weighted key value. Okay, so key value are two of the parts of a uh, transformer. So normally you have the queries, the keys, and the value. But here you have only the keys and the values, and they're also weighted according to a receptance. So we don't really know what these terms mean just yet, but I'm sure they'll tell us in this paper. That combines the efficient parallelizable training of transformers with the efficient inference of RNNs. Okay, so it's some kind of hybrid type of situation. Our approach leverages linear attention and allows us to formulate the model as either a transformer or an RNN. Okay, the use of the word either here is a little bit weird. I wonder what that means. Which parallelizes computations during training and maintains constant computational and memory complexity during inference. Yeah, so kind of they're pointing out the fact that the computational and memory complexity is going to change whether you're doing inference or training. And ideally, you want good performance on both. Leading to the first non-transformer architecture to be scaled to tens of billions of parameters. Is that true? I don't, that's probably not true. I feel like there has to be some other random architecture that someone made at one point that has more than 10 billion parameters. Our experiments reveal that RWKV performs on par with similarly sized transformers, suggesting that future work can leverage this architecture to create more efficient models. This work presents a significant step towards reconciling the trade-offs between computational efficiency and model performance in sequence modeling, sequence processing tasks. It's kind of weird that they chose to use the word processing there. Usually the word modeling makes more sense. But uh, computational efficiency and model performance, a trade-off. Hello, Sagi. Nice to see you. It's been a while. Uh, deep learning techniques have made significant 
strides in artificial intelligence playing a pivotal role in various scientific and industrial applications. Blah, blah, blah. Deep learning is cool. RNNs are a thing. Convnets are a thing. RNNs suffer from the vanishing gradient problem. Uh, the vanishing gradient problem happens whenever you have a very deep neural network or any kind of neural network architecture where the uh, the path from the actual loss function to the actual weight that you want to change is very long, right? Very far. And the reason that that path is very long in an RNN is because you need to go all the way back in time, right? RNN is just kind of this fundamental concept that uh, at each time step, you basically feed the previous time step. Yeah, this is a nice little picture. So if you're doing a sequence or maybe it's a robot and you have a, a set of actions over time, right? The action at time step two or the token at time step two is going to not only the here the A is the model, but it's not only going to depend on the uh, actual input at that time step, it's also going to depend on the previous time step. So if you wanted to actually push gradients, let's say you had the uh, answer here and you wanted to push a gradient backward into this A, you'd have to basically push it back into here and then push it back into here. And then by the time you get to the whatever, all the way to the beginning of the sequence, you've gone through so many layers that your gradient is going to be very, very small, right? So that's the vanishing gradient problem applied to recurrent neural networks. I came to see your YouTube. Appreciate it, man. This is a very hardcore paper today, so you better be ready to look at some gnarly math. Uh, additionally, they cannot be parallelized in the time dimension during training, right? Because you need to have basically this whole sequence of previous time steps, which restricts their scalability. Convnets, CNNs, on the other hand, are adept at capturing local patterns, which limits their capacity to deal with long range dependencies, crucial to many sequence processing tasks. Uh, this isn't necessarily true. The The way that most Convnets are designed, they're hierarchical. So yes, the lower levels of the Convnet are only seeing a local uh, amount or a local part of the input. But as soon as you go a couple hierarchies up in a Convnet, the higher uh, levels of the Convnet are global in nature, right? They can see the entire sequence. So I would, I would disagree a little bit with this because most confidence are able to deal with long-range dependencies, especially as you go higher up in the hierarchy. What's up, bro? Cooking this hardware, hardcore paper. Nice. Transformer models emerged as a powerful alternative due to their ability to handle both local and long-range dependencies and their capability for parallelized training. I don't... I don't know if, like, they're trying to paint this picture that the reason people use transformers is because they they can look at the entire sequence at the same time, but, like, that's not really, I, I don't know if I agree with this narrative. I feel like the reason people use transformers is because they work super well, right? And it's not, like, it. it's kind of a black box. We don't really know why they work super well, right? It's it. The reason they're popular is because, one, they're actually very conceptually simple, Two, they're kind of infinitely stackable. You can just keep stacking them and, and kind of scale them, and you can just take that block and repeat it a million times, and it still works. And three, it works very, very, very well. You know, that's the problem. Like, a lot of people, like, RNNs are kind of theoretically much better, right? Like, they're, they it feels like an RNN should work better, but they don't, and transformers work better. So I would say it's just kind of the the way that the universe worked out is why transformers became popular. Recent models such as GPT-3, ChatGPT, GPT-4, Llama, and Chinchilla exemplify the capability of this architecture, pushing the frontiers of what's possible. The self-intention mechanism inherent poses unique challenges, primarily due to its quadratic complexity. So here is the actual time and space complexity. So if you guys have ever uh, interviewed for big tech jobs, you basically have to do what's these little like leak code problems. They're like interview problems. And part of that is you basically, anytime you write any algorithm, such as, I don't know, like find the shortest substring or some kind of little toy problem like that, you have to be able to say, what is the time complexity? And then what is the space complexity? So time complexity is how long the algorithm takes to run. 
and space complexity is basically how much memory it takes to run, right? How big is the size of the memory that you need to store intermediate uh, variables and intermediate results in order to get to that final result. And uh, the size of the sequence, uh, T denotes the sequence length. So how long is the sentence that you're actually trying to model, or maybe it's like the length of the list in whatever little leak code problem you're doing. D is the feature dimension, so here they're talking about the uh, kind of intermediate embeddings within these different types of bundle architectures. And then C is mega's chunk size for quadratic attention. So I think what they mean by chunk size here is whenever you take the sequence and chunk it into little pieces, and then what is the size of that chunk? So obviously transformers, ooh, transformers, why is this not transformer? You have that T squared and then you have this T squared here. So you have the this quadratic complexity. But this paper here, RWKV, you do not have that. It's just T and D. So the space complexity just depends on how big you want to make this feature dimension. And the time complexity basically is dominated by the sequence length and the feature dimension. So you don't have quadratic there, which is the whole point. And then here you have a bunch of other different types of weird transformer variants that people have tried, but none of these are as good as this, right? T times D, T times D plus D squared, T log D, T D, T D squared. It does seem like the RWKV has the best theoretical time and space complexity. Uh... Is Google not willing to open their technology anymore? Uh, yes, generally not. I feel like uh, most of the big tech companies are becoming more and more secretive. We read the Palm 2 technical report when it came out on the channel, so you can look at that video if you want, but it was basically 90 pages of nothing. They're not really telling you anything anymore. Uh, this complexity renders the architecture com computationally expensive and memory intensive for tasks. <laughs> I like this. They could have said computationally intensive and memory expensive or computationally expensive and memory expensive. Expensive and intensive are kind of basically the same word. It's kind of a weird choice there. These limitations have spurred a wealth of research aiming to improve the scaling properties, often at the expense of some of the properties that make it so effective. I kind of like, I'm liking the the the, the way that this is written. Like, this almost feels like I'm reading a like a book or something. Uh, to tackle these challenges, we introduced the RWKV uh, novel architecture, carefully designed to alleviate the model bo memory bottleneck uh, while still preserving the rich expressive properties. One of the defining characteristics is the ability to offer parallelized training. So parallelized means doing things in parallel, which means uh, doing them at the same time. And robust scalability. Uh, moreover, we have reformulated the attention mechanism in RWKV to introduce a variant of linear attention. Okay, so there's going to be some kind of attention mechanism in there. Eschewing the traditional dot product token interaction in favor of more effective channel directed interaction. Hmm. So what do they mean by dot product token interaction? So in a transformer... Uh, <laughs> look at that. This is like an actual transformer, a uh, transformer uh, neural net. Uh, let's look for a nice little pick. Transformer neural net attention. I can't get a single attention map. Where is an attention map? Over here. Here we go. This is one. Uh, sure, let's do this. So this is the sequence, right? The firm for which Jacob worked sent him to New York. So this is the sequence. This is the sequence again. So again, you have a uh, quadratic amount of compute that you need to do in order to basically calculate every token in the sequence and what their dot product is with every other token in the sequence. So you see that for this token here, Jacob, you're going to have to calculate the dot product of this token, Jacob, which is end up going to be a vector, right? A token is just a vector. An embedding is a vector. Everything is a vector, right? But a token is more like a primitive vector. It's just kind of like a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0
vectors, but the vectors don't have a ton of information in them. But uh, you're multiplying for this token and this token, that's a dot product. For this token and this token, that's a dot product. Every single one of these squares is a dot product. So that's what they mean here. The traditional dot product token interaction in favor of a more effective channel directed interaction. So channel has like a million different uh, meanings. Generally, it just means a specific dimension and some high dimensional tensor. That's what it means to me, kind of in the comp or in the computer vision world. But I think that there's a there's probably going to be a specific kind of NLP definition of channel, but we'll see what that is. Uh, what is traditional linear attention? A variant of linear attention? I don't know. I don't know what linear attention is. I think they're, they're going to describe it. In the related work section or preliminaries, I bet you they tell you exactly what linear attention is and what the variant that they do is paper was written by a bunch of enthusiasts so the style is not strictly scientific paper yeah it reads nicer this approach contrasts significant with the traditional transformer where specific token interactions predominantly drive attention the implementation of linear attention in rwkv is carried out without approximation okay so something there the overarching motivation is bridging the gap it offers promising and viable solution for handling tasks involving large scale models with billions of parameters, exhibiting competitive performance at a fraction of the computational cost. Uh, our results suggest that RWKV could be a valuable tool for addressing the ongoing challenges and scaling and deploying models, particularly those involving sequential data processing and pretty much any kind of task can be turned into some kind of sequence processing task. Image understanding is a sequence processing task. If you think of an image as a sequence of patches, any kind of robotics task is a sequence, sequential data processing task. Any kind of video, anything that has time is a sequential data processing task. So basically everything is a sequence. So <laughs> that's why you can apply transformers to everything. And that's why you can apply RWKV to everything. Uh, next generation we introduce our contributions are as follows all right here we go boom these are going to be the main contributions of this paper in a nice little bulleted list uh, so obviously the architecture itself which is kind of the meat of this paper uh, a new attention mechanism which they call uh, their their variant of linear attention uh, co a comprehensive series of experiments and benchmark data on benchmark data sets and a releasing a pre-trained model uh, and they have a small one of 169 million parameters and then they have one with 14 billion parameters trained on the pile so the pile is uh, a big stack of code the pile Yeah, this is the Luther AI's data set. So it's 825 gigabytes of open source language modeling data set. I don't know how much cleaning has been done, but this was created back in the day when Connor Leahy was part of, uh, you see him here, Leahy Connor. Apparently you can download this, but I'm not going to click that button or else the stream is going to explode. All right. Related work. A number of techniques. Many transformer variants, X-formers, have been introduced to reduce the complexity of transformers. All right. So we've looked at some of these in the channel. We were looking at megabyte. You got things like sparse attention. You got chunked attention. Paper after paper flash attention. So people have been trying to get rid of this quadratic complexity in all kinds of interesting ways. Despite being memory efficient, their time complexity remains quadratic or contains chunk size as a hidden factor. This is kind of what we saw in the megabyte paper where the the size of the chunking was kind of a hyperparameter. Okay. Eleuther AI says this paper is not yet final and will be refined. Yeah. If you actually go to the GitHub, they do have like a, first of all, I recommend this readme because they explain a lot of things, but they do have a little section here where they say what they're going to be working on next. And they had some pretty cool things here. So they actually mentioned they might be doing this for vision. Yeah. 
vision tasks. Like he said, the they said they might be doing like a diffusion, stable diffusion type model, but using this as kind of the uh, main architecture, which is kind of cool to think about. All right, we're getting distracted. Let's get back to here. Uh, another line of research replaces the attention mechanism with other modules to scale to long sequence. Okay, so you have other people that have tried to do non-transformer type thing. So MLP mixer, this is multi-layer perceptron. Attention-free transformer, AFT. Uh, inspired by AFT, replaces dot product self-attention with a computationally efficient alternative which can be seen as multi-headed attention where each feature dimension corresponds to a head. Okay. Similar approach but modifies the interaction weights for simplicity such that it can be transformed into an RNN. In parallel RNN style, recursive components have also been modified to increase context length such as recurrent memory transformers, linear recurrent units, state space models, and its variants. Quasi-recurrent neural network. <laughs> what a cool name, QRNN. Uses both convolutional layers and recurrent pooling functions across time steps and channels. So one of the big advantages of convolution is that you can basically choose the, the kind of stride length and it allows you to, to kind of trade off very easily how much of the of the actual sequence you want to sample and convolution and pooling are very efficient ways of reducing the dimensionality of an input so of course there's going to be all kinds of papers that try to use that in order to uh, deal with very long sequences RWKV employs a time mixing module I think time here, they probably mean uh, the dimension of time, which means how far along the sequence you are. Different from the element-wise pooling in QRNN, uh, RWKV introduces a parameterized channel mixing module that is parallelizable. Okay, there you go, boom. So they, they need to get to that point where it's parallelizable, right? They need to be able to do the entire sequence in parallel in order to be competitive with the fact that a transformer can do the entire sequence in parallel. So it seems like the way they're going to do that is with this channel mixing module, which I guess is this time mixing module. We briefly review the fundamentals of RNNs and transformers. There's this Schmidt-Huber reference that 1997 OG reference right there. Popular RNN architecture such as the LSTM, this is long short-term memory, and GRU, this is gated recurrent unit, are characterized by the following formulation. The data flow of RNNs is shown. So uh, here you have a weight, I guess, and they bias, so this is like a, a layer. What is U of F here? RNNs can be factored into two linear blocks, W and U, and an RNN specific block. So F, I, O, and C. Dude, this is like, they don't even tell you what any of these variables are. All we know is that W and U are blocks, which means that they're transforming some input here. Right, X is an input, H is an input. I think these are just uh, the bias. Jesus Christ, dude, this is not looking good. Do we have values here? Yeah, this is what we want. All right, boom, that's what they're doing. So this is an LSTM block, and you see here that uh, the output, H of T, often called the hidden state, is fed into the next. So you have your input at, at this time step, that's xt. Then you have the hidden state from the previous time step, ht minus 1, right? So I think that's these are the same h and the same t, right? So this is the hidden state at the previous time step. And then this is the hidden state that gets fed into the next time step. This little dot here uh, often means uh, the Hamard product, which is basically just element-wise, element 
wise product it's called Hamard yeah this or Hadamard it's basically you just multiply everything by everything so this first element by the first element to get the first element the second element by the second element to get the second element so you get uh, if you multiply an m by n matrix with an m by n matrix you get an m by n matrix so it's not an actual matrix multiplication it's an element wise matrix multiplication so you're going to get the same size matrix out of that so whenever you see this it tells you that ft and ct minus one are both the same size and then you're going to get the same size back right you see ft times ct minus one the dimensionality of ft is preserved the dimensionality of ct minus one is preserved and of course ct is going to have the same dimension as ct minus one uh c tilde t i don't know what that tilde refers to let's see if we can see a tilde somewhere here it's probably this the c hat t here and then this i t can we like get fucking okay here we go boom x t is the input at time step h t is the output c t is the cell state okay never mind it's not uh, HT is not the hidden state. HT is the output, and CT is the hidden state. CT is the one that gets kind of passed back and forth. FT is the forget gate. What the forget gate does is it basically gets rid of some of the uh, uh, context. So the recurrent neural network is taking the input from the previous time step and then using it in this time step. But before it does that, you see how we take this is the input from the previous RNN cell. Before it does that, we forget parts of it. And what does that mean? We basically multiply it by this vector that kind of like zeroes out certain parts of it. So only the parts that we care about are end up are are going to end up affecting uh, the output at this time step. And C hat T is the internal time internal cell state. So the internal cell state you see here, it gets added to the already existing cell state and this is why um it's a standard lstm formula this is why a lot of people will say that rnns are not good at long sequences right theoretically an lstm can deal with an infinite sequence because it just keeps infinitely referring to itself but the problem is that at every at every time step in a recurrent network you're multiplying by this forget gate and then you're adding it to adding to it the new internal cell state so even though you theoretically have that same little vector that you've had since since you could you could have that in infinity time steps ago by the time you get to this time step it's been so much it's been multiplied by this kind of forget gate so many times and it's been added to the new context so many times that it's kind of, it, it like erodes it becomes kind of like the vanishing gradient problem but in inference right where it's basically it, it doesn't end up learning uh things from very far away or from very long ago because it kind of like over time it forgets it and i know the whole point of the lstm is that it has a long term and then it has a short term but even with that i feel like it still forgets over time Uh, okay, so that's what an R what an LSTM is. Uh, the data dependency relies on previous time steps, prohibiting parallelizing these typical RNNs, right? And then kind of what we were saying before, where because you need uh, this hidden state to calculate the current state, you need you need to basically do everything in serial serially. Right, because you don't know, you can't calculate the third thing without knowing the second thing, and you can't calculate the second thing without knowing the first thing, and so on. So, it's a big problem, the fact that you have to do that. All right, transformers. Another reference for our boy Vaswami. Uh, transformers are a class of neural networks that have become the imp dominant architecture for several NLP tasks and the dominant architecture for a bunch of tasks. Uh, instead of operating on sequences step by step, like RNNs, transformer rely on attention mechanisms to capture relationships between all input and all output tokens. Right, so transformers are doing the entire sequence in one big attention chunk. And here's your basic attention mechanism. You have your queries, you have your keys, and you have your values. So I like uh, the way that Karpathy explains this, and he has a uh, 
he has specific terms for these. So he calls the queries, he says, uh, you can think of the queries as what are the things that I'm looking for? And then he says the keys are what are the things that I have? And then the values are what are the things that I'm going to communicate, right? So what you're doing fundamentally here in this Q times K, right? This Q times K transpose, this is a transpose. This is just a matrix multiplication here. You're saying uh, some of the things that I'm looking for in these queries are going to correspond to some of the things that I have, which are the keys, right? So if there is a high agreement between the things that I'm looking for and the things that I have, then this value is going to be very big for that, right? And this here, this QK, uh, the the me in that, the like what things that I want, the I is referring to uh, every little uh, kind of point here, right? So this this little token here is saying has some queries, some values, and then some keys. Jesus Christ, that explanation is so bad. I apologize. But you take your queries and your keys, the queries that have a key that corresponds to them very exactly, right? And they have a high activation. You're going to put that through a softmax. So you don't want this matrix here, this uh, attention matrix to have huge values and extremely tiny values. You want all the values to be kind of shaped nicely, right? So you're going to put that through a softmax, which is going to s squash it. So everything's either going to be zero and one, basically, right? If you guys have never seen what a softmax actually looks like IRL, that's the equation for a softmax, but this is what the actual uh, function looks like, right? So if you have a query and a key that multiply together and give you a value of, of infinity, by putting it through the softmax, you get a value of one. If you have a query and a value that give you somehow a negative infinity, you're going to get zero. So it kind of just squashes the input of that attention matrix or the output of that attention matrix so that it's nicely shaped. And then that, each of those is used to basically say, well, how much of this particular value, which are the things that I want to communicate, am I going to send to the next attention block? <laughs> Softmax is used to transform those dot products into a probability distribution over input tokens. Yeah, so it's that that's also still also like probability distribution. You know, just because it's between zero and one doesn't mean it has to be. It is a probability. What you're by squashing it between zero and one, you can interpret it as a probability. But you know, at the end of the day, it's it's not actually like you're. You're, you're getting the real probability. It's just a number between zero and one that you're interpreting as the probability. Um, okay. Where the multi-headedness and scaling factor one over square root of DK. So DK is the dimensionality of the feature space here. I think this corresponds to the D that they're using here. The feature dimension, right? So Obviously, you're going to have a bunch of these heads in parallel. You're going to have a bunch of these attention heads in parallel, and then you divide by this 1 over square root of dk so that the number of heads doesn't matter. Uh, all those values have a sum equal to 1, so legit probability distribution. You're telling me that every value in an attention matrix attention map sums to 1? Tension map. Tension map transformers. Is that true? Maybe. Hmm. Okay, let's keep going. We're 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 not even on page. We're on page three. <laughs> the core QKT multiplication is an ensemble of pairwise attention scores between each token in a sequence, which can be decomposed as vector operations. So here, all they did was just take the softmax equation and just uh, expand it. So rather than having the word softmax as a function that takes in the QK 
transpose, they actually plug in the equation of the softmax and then turn this into a sum over all the different query vectors and key vectors and value vectors. Uh, in AFT, so this is the previous work that they were referencing here, this attention-free transformer, this is alternatively formulated as, okay, so in AFT they basically replace the Q with a W, because why not? Uh, and they do WTI plus KI. So this is interesting. So here you have a dot product. You have a dot product between the query and the key. But here it's no longer a dot product. It's a sum. Right? And that's why they call it a bias. Right? Because you're no longer doing a dot product here. You're doing a sum. So that's kind of interesting. The AFT basically gets rid of this dot product, turns it into a sum. So now you're summing this new vector or this new these new vectors WTI, which they call learned pairwise position biases. The dimensionality of this WTI is t, t times t, uh, which is sequence times sequence. Right? T is the length of the sequence, and the reason this has to be t times t or t by t as the dimensionality is because you're adding them together so they have to match with the dimensionality of these keys versus the queries uh, because you're doing this matrix multiply the dimensionality needs to be different there. Inspired by AFT we let each WTI and RWKV be a channel wise time decay vector. Okay. So basically, they're going to be doing what AFT did, except rather than having a learned pairwise position bias, they're going to use a channel-wise time decay vector multiplied by the relative position traced backwards from current time as it decays. So WTI equals negative T minus I times W. What are these? W is of dimensionality D, where D is the number of channels. Okay. So finally, we figure out what channel means in this. So what, when they use the word channel, they're referring to the uh, size of the feature dimension, which is actually consistent with uh, the terminology that I would use in computer vision. So in computer vision, uh, when you have a ConvNet, you guys wanted it, dude. Here I am bringing out my ConvNet again to explain things. Um, here we go. But... Uh, in your original image, right, you have three channels for RGB, but then usually as you go higher levels into the uh, convolutional neural net, you have the feature dimension here, this 9, is also called the channels. You can also think of that as the number of channels. So more channels, you have more kind of high-level abstract semantic concepts, right, which is usually why you see more channels as you go higher and then each of the individual channels you could think of it like a little feature map that's another way to call it but they're going to use the word channel to represent this feature dimension which is what what I'm uh, getting from this D is the number of channels we require W to be non-negative to ensure that E to the WTI is less than 1 so E is just uh, the natural logarithm I think it's like 2.81 right uh, natural Natural number E. 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 There we go. Euler's number. But where where does this fucking number come from? Like why do people use this number, right? And the people the reason people use this number is because it's it's this shape, right? So anytime you see that that E or you see a uh, a log that doesn't have a number on it, right? So a natural logarithm. Just think of basically this shape, this like nice curve, right? So whenever people have E in their equations, it's because somewhere in that they want this nice shape, right? And we were looking at the softmax, right? And the softmax has that same nice shape, right? It has these same nice curves. So it should make sense that the, the equation for the softmax is e to the zi over e to the zj because like the, the e there is just, that's what's giving you that little curve shape, right? So 
what are they saying? They're saying because e to the x is undefined for negative numbers, they have to make sure, or they have to, or no, it's e is, what are they saying here? We require w to be non-negative to ensure that e to the w is less than or equal to 1. So they want e to that number to be less than or equal to 1. So they want x, e to the x, to be less than or equal to 1. So the crossing point of y equals e to the x is here right at 1, which means that you have to feed in an x that is less than 0 in order to get y equals e to the x of less than or equal to 1. Or no, the opposite. I don't know, I think I just confused myself with these double negatives, but the per channel weights decay backward in time. So per channel, per element in the feature dimension, as you go backwards in time, which means as you go backwards in the sequence, the weight is going to decay. So the weights are going to be smaller and smaller and smaller as you go backward in time. But, I don't know, this seems a little sketchy because you're basically saying that I want the weights of which are probably going to be determining how important and how relevant the things are in the sequence to, to decay over time. So you're kind of telling me that, okay, the things, if I am here at step x equals 1, and I, or I'm at step x equals 4, how important is the stuff at x equals 3? How important is the stuff at x equals 2? How important is the stuff at x equals 1? And that relationship is going to kind of look like this. It's going to have that, sh that curve in it because they're using it here and these weights are probably going to determine how important the things are in previous time steps. So they're almost like locking in this, this curve. You sum a row of this mat and get one. E is giving us nice derivatives, makes math easier. That's another reason too. It, the derivative of E and the integral of E are easy. Uh, derivative and integral of E. Huh? Here you go. Where is it? Here you go. E to the x and the derivative of that. Oh my god, dude. This is garbage. Can I just get a picture? Here you go. Look at that. So the integral of e to the 2x dx is e to the 2x over 2 plus c, which is the constant, because you can, depending on where you want to put that in the uh, axis, you're going to get a different area under the curve. But the integral and the derivatives of e are simple. E, it guess that means the beginning of the sequence, those weights are small, more recent information is getting mixed in, and the longer you go, the less you incorporate. It's like exponential averaging or momentum. The less momentum you have, the more recent speed change affects your current speed. Yeah, I just feel like it's kind of locking in that relationship, though. That's, that's kind of where I think it's maybe a little bit sketchy. Because I don't think the the importance of things as you go backward in time is going to follow any kind of curve. I feel like they're... You know, there might be something that a thousand time steps ago that's super important and then something that's 200 time steps ago that's kind of important. And then, you know what I'm saying, like the function of like how important things are as a function of time is constantly changing. It doesn't have a nice shape. Computational structure of the RWKV in comparison to QRNN and RNN. So this is the quasi-RNN. And then they have vanilla RNN, LSTMs, which is a type of RNN, gated recurrent unit, another type of RNN. Color code, orange indicates time mixing, convolutions or matrix multiplications. And the continuous block indicates that these computations can proceed simultaneously. So if it's a, a block like that, it means you can do it uh, in parallel. Blue signifies parameterless functions that operate concurrently along the channel or feature dimension, element-wise. Green indicates channel mixing. Okay, so it's gonna take us a second to unpack this, so let's see. We got orange, which means time mixing, linear, 
RNN cell. You have inputs from each of these chunks of the linear coming in here. Continuous block indicates that these computations can proceed simultaneously. So this is these are not continuous blocks, which means you have to basically do this one before you can do this one before you can do this one, which makes sense, right? You have this basically you have to do it in three chunks. You have your RNN cell. You get your input that gives you the output. In order to get the next, uh, calculate the next thing, you need both the input of this step and then you need the output of the previous step. So that kind of makes sense. And here they're just showing you multiple RNN cells kind of block or stacked together. All right, quasi RNN. You have convolution and pooling. So you can do all of this in one. Pooling is not dependent on anything else, right? You can pool in parallel, which is what they're showing you there. And pooling is a parameterless function. There's no parameters to learn in a pooling, right? All you're doing is just basically taking either the max pool or the average pool or whatever you want. So you don't need, there's no learned parameters in there. Okay, and then RWKV. Green indicates channel mixing, and then orange mixing. So why is channel mixing something that you can do simultaneously? That's the question here. I need more coffee. Analogous to positional embedding, tokens that are far away have less relevance due to distance. Yeah. But do you think that the relevance and distance, that function, how does it actually change depending on the sequence? That sequence is as a, or the relationship between distance and relevance is extremely dependent on the sequence and it's going to change sequence to sequence. That's why. So I feel like putting any kind of prior, having any kind of uh, assumed kind of prior or or kind of hard coded assumption on the on the relationship between distance and relevance, is I feel like a, I feel like that's not the right way to do it, right? Which is why transformers work so well because they don't have any they don't have any kind of prior there. Transformers don't have any prior on. The relationship between distance and relevance because they just do the entire sequence at the same time so whatever that relationship is it just it has the ability to appear versus like a recurrent neural network you have to in some way keep passing that around so you're, you're here they're putting the prior of this the shape of the e function hmm. okay the receptance weighted key value model. The RWKV architecture derives its names from the four primary model elements used in the time mixing and channel mixing blocks. You have R, the receptance vector acting as the acceptance of past information. So this is kind of like the forget gate, right? In your LSTM here, where is the LSTM? you have this, this forget gate, which is basically selectively picking which part of the previous hidden state to forget and which part to keep going forward. So that's kind of what I'm seeing here. Uh, the weight is the positional weight decay vector. So this is the vector that, that Kalina and I are arguing about, right? This is the vector that basically uh, determines how important things that are further away in time are, right? And it's kind of this like steady decay where as you go further and further back in time, uh, things are going to be less and less important. But the interesting thing here is that it's trainable, so it's going to change. You're going to learn the best shape for this. Key is a vector analogous to the key to the K in traditional attention, which is uh, in the words of Karpathy, the things that I have, and then value 
is the vector analogous to V in traditional attention, which according to Karpathy is the things that I want to communicate. So interactions between main elements for every time step are multiplicative as illustrated in figure two. Okay, so here we have the actual figure, the actual RWKV block element. And then R left. Wow, this is actually kind of confused. This is two separate things here. There's there's no connection between here. You see there's actually like no arrow that goes between these. This is one brick. And then this brick is basically this here. So you see how time mixing, time mixing, channel mixing, channel mixing, layer norm, layer norm, layer norm, layer norm. And this is actually, so one thing that you notice here is in the attention is all you need paper. In the original attention is all you need paper, the layer norms were at the end, right? So you see this, the, the add a norm here was after the attention block, but apparently now it's more common to do it before the attention block, which actually makes more sense because you're shaping and making sure that the values that are going into your attention block are nice and uh, well spread out right around that zero to one kind of area. So layer norms before these blocks, then you have two blocks in a row. You have the time mixing block and then the channel mixing block. The time mixing block, what is this mu? Do they define that? Comprised of a series of stacked residual blocks, each formed by time mixing and channel mixing subblocks with recurrent architectures. So the recurrent structure, where where is that coming in? That's weird. It's not coming in here. So this is a residual connection here. So this is just you see here the path that it goes from here and then it residual and then it gets concatenated. So these are just residual connections which are analogous to the uh, residual connections here. Right, you see that little residual connection. But here, this arrow right here, this is the actual uh, recurrent arrow. So the output of this channel mixing is taken out, and then at the next time step, it's fed in. So this is the actual recurrent part, right? Uh, with recurrent structures. This channel mixing works simultaneously because it mixes all the tokens just like attention does, except attention does it for blocks of original DIM and RWKV does it for all channels. I guess. The recurrence is formulated both as linear interpolation between the current input and the input of the previous time step, a technique we refer to as time shift mixing or token shift linear interpolation between the current input and the input at the previous time step. That's a little sketchy. They're taking, they're just like interpolating between those? What? So they're taking the input of the current time step and the input of the previous time step and then interpolating, linearly interpolating between those? How can you guarantee that that interpolation is like meaningful, right? Which can be adjusted independently for every linear projection of the input, RKV in time mixing and RK in channel mixing. And is time dependent update, as the time dependent update of the WKV, which is formalized in equation 14, the WKV computation is similar to AFT, but W is now a channel wise vector multiplied by a relative position rather than a pairwise matrix. We also introduce a vector u for separately attending to the current token in order to compensate for potential degeneration of w. So potential degeneration of w might refer to the problem we were talking about where eventually you would forget because the w's would just decay over time and then you wouldn't have anything from the previous thing. RWKV architecture for language modeling. 
Okay, so this is the block itself, but then this is the block uh, for uh, with the time dimension shown, right? So here you're just getting the block kind of at one specific frozen uh, token in the sequence, but here's what it would actually look like when you have multiple tokens. So you can see the recurrent uh, behavior here, right? Where uh, you feed in this token here, my name is, right? So first token is my, goes through, layer norm, residual connection, layer norm, time mix, concatenate, residual connection, layer norm. The token shift is here. Oh shit, this is kind of cool. And also this is wrong. This little arrow here should come down here, if this is correct. Right? Shouldn't this arrow here come from down here rather than from here in order to be consistent with this? But after the channel mix, you add it to the residual path here. Then you have more crap. Then you have a language model head. And then you have the final output, which you can see here it's predicting the next token. So when you input this token, the output should be the next token, you're predicting the next token, so here you go, here's the next token. Yeah, those explanations are so dense. No, I agree with you, like, I'm reading this and I like, I'm like, dude, what the fuck is that? <laughs> what, what do all these mean, <laughs> you know? Okay, but we're making sense of it, you know, we can see the recurrence here, we can see how there's, fundamentally, there's two different bricks here. You have this time mix and then you have this channel mix. The token shift, this is the weird one. This is the linear interpolation between the current input and the previous time step. That is that is weird. That's That means they're basically taking this and then linearly interpolating it with this. How is that? I just don't understand how that's useful, right? It's like if I take an embedding vector for some random specific thing and I take another embedding vector for a random another random specific thing and I interpolate between those two embedding vectors I feel like that interpolated embedding vector is neither representative of the first thing nor the second thing so I don't know exactly why that's useful but they do the same thing up here as well with this token shift and we I still don't know what this mu is Did they define that up here? They did not. What is the mu in an LSTM? It's probably the same. No. What is this? What is this little mu? Uh, but you split it up into RKV, WKV. So this is the and then this is the softmax here. Let's see if we can understand it better by looking at these. The time mixing block is given by RT, you got the weights for R, you got the weights for K, and you got the weights for V. As time T, so T is time. Vector OT, what is OT? performs a weighted summation in the positional interval of 1 to t and then multiplies with the receptance sigma of r. Okay, so we finally got definition for sigma of r. It's called receptance, right? Which is similar to the kind of LSTM concept of like the forget gate, which means that there's certain things that you want to get rid of and certain things that you want to uh, remember. And that receptance is going to largely t uh, determine that. You have this weighted, uh, where is it? Uh, summation of an increase in, performs a weighted summation. So you have, scrolling back up here, you have this situation going on here, right? Where we turn this from a dot product into a sum. You have, 
we're still not getting a definition for what this mu is. Where is that? But this mu is imp multiplying the input. Here you have the input from the previous. Those are the same here. So you have input xt, 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 and then input from previous time step xt minus 1, xt minus 1, xt minus 1. Right, so R, T, and R, T, K, T, and V, T, which are basically the three things here, R, T, K, T, V, T, all of them are taking in the same thing here, right? This, this kind of looks like a hyperparameter, to be honest. 1 minus mu k and then mu k. So it almost sounds like mu k is something that like trades off between the current time step and the previous time step. So however important something is in the in the current time step, here you have the opposite of that for the previous time step. So that right there just this is a very common pattern for hyperparameters like this that are where you basically have the hyperparameter and then one minus the hyperparameter. I guess figure two shows transformer mode and figure three shows RNN mode. Formula 14 requires T steps of computation. Yes, but I think the whole point is that you're going to be able to do this in parallel. So even though you have these summations here, right, where basically, hey, if I want to figure out uh, the value of this at time step T, right, this summation here is extremely annoying because I have to basically do this summation all the way from I equals 1 to T minus 1. So basically, I need to do I need to do this, this here, which is the kind of like the the uh, soft max but the but the soft max with the with the sum rather than the dot product the annoying thing is that i have to do that for all t up until this t so if i'm at the 999th position in the sequence i need to have 999 there's going to be 998 terms in this summation here which is annoying all right but let's look further here so T minus 1 minus I times W. So this is the term here that's going to uh, decrease as you go further, right? So as T minus, as this T goes further back, you're going to get a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller thing. And that's going to be roughly how you make sure that the things in the past are not as important. This is the values. At time step i, this is the values at time step t. So t is the time step that you want, the current time step. vi is the previous time step. u plus kt, what is this u? Dude, this is so much harder if if you don't define the variables. Like, if you're going to have equations, just sh tell me what each of the variables in the equation are. Like, it just, this blows my mind. Like, why would you have these equations and not li literally not define specific variables in those? <laughs> w? Where is U? Where do they define this U? u plus kt, u plus kt, e to the negative, this is the same. So you see these terms and this term is the same. And then this term and this term is the same. So the only thing they're doing here is basically here they're multiplying by the vi and the vt, which is the values which is coming from this here. They can cache partial sums and reuse them on subsequent steps. Yeah, and then here the final kind of ace in the hole here is the element wise product, uh, where you have your forget gate times WKV. So This is where you're actually determining what gets passed on and what gets not passed on. I think OT is the output, so WO is an extra weights. 
wr wk wv wo wr wk wv and then i guess wo is this one here w just assuming because it's the only one that doesn't there i would have called it ww i guess the wkv plays the role of attention in transformers without incurring a quadratic cost. So why does it not incur a quadratic cost? As interactions are between scalars. So interactions in the transformers or in a transformer attention are between vectors. So in a in a transformer attention attention map let's go to our attention map right every single one of these uh, squares that you have to calculate is a dot product right because the you're you're doing a q times v right so here, right, you're doing QT transpose times K. So this is a dot product, which means it's a vector times a vector, right? So you have to do that for every single brick there. But here, what they're saying is that they're not vectors, they're scalars, right? So by turning this into a plus, right, WTI plus K instead of QT transpose times K. Now it's a scalar, which means you can do it in parallel. Performs a weighted summation in the position of only 1 to T and then multiplies with the receptance. Interactions are multiplicative inside a given time step and summed over different time steps. Yeah, so I think it's what you're saying, Kalina. It's like, look at the first term in the sum. It is not dependent on the current time step. So the first term in the sum, yeah, it only goes to t minus 1. So, but I mean, it is dependent on this here. You do have this v of t here. But... In, you don't have to recompute the whole sum. For the channel mixing block is given by RT equals WR times mu R XT plus one minus mu R XT minus one. KT is WK times mu K XT plus one minus mu K XT minus one. And OT is equal to sigma RT, so the same receptance here at time step t, dot pro, or hamard, handmard, element wise product, wv times the max of kt and zero. So this is the uh, ReLU, or squared ReLU, I guess, since there's a square there. So obviously a ReLU is flat, so anything below zero is basically zero, and then it's linear. Right? So this is what a ReLU looks like. A squared ReLU is going to look like this, except it's going to be squared. So this, the non-zero part is going to be a square. And another way to write a square ReLU is max kt comma zero squared. Vanilla attention, you have to perform dot product with a newly generated key and query that forces you to recompute the sum. This is way less transformery than I'd imagined to be. Yeah, I, I still just don't, I'm, I just still don't feel super comfortable here because they're just like not defining these terms. So we're, we're gonna, we're kind of having to like infer what these mean, right? I still don't know what the fuck this mu k is. <laughs> and also the hard part about this too is that Whenever you're doing these kind of uh, transformer 
attention mechanisms, it's not about the efficiency of the attention mechanism itself, like in math, in just an equation. It's about the efficiency of the attention mechanism when you're doing it in a batch of data on a GPU, right? So it's like there's additional complexity there, right? It's like the efficiency is not important in, in actual like equation terms. It's the efficiency when you're doing it in batch, in batches on a GPU. So that's that's where I feel like some of this is not intuitive, right? Where for some reason this weighted sum results in something that you can intermediately cache or that you can basically do uh, in a batch on a GPU faster than the attention mechanism. That's that's the TLDR, but unfortunately that TLDR isn't satisfying because it's like you don't really know exactly what the fuck is going on. All right, so finally at least they they uh they're they're confirming for us that this receptance here, this sigma RT is basically the equivalent of the forget gate, right? So it's just going to remove certain things from the uh, vector that gets passed to the next time step, right? This sigma RT, and that's going to change, and you're going to learn the parameters of that. Let's see, transformer-like parallelization. RWKV can be efficiently parallelized in what we call a time parallel mode, reminiscent of transformers. So what do they mean by this is that uh, parallel in the time dimension, time dimension here is the sequence. The time complexity of processing a batch of sequences in a single layer is uh, big O notation BTD squared, which consists mainly of matrix multiplications between these uh, different uh, here. So this this matrix multiplication here where you're multiplying this big WR times these vectors here, right? That's what's driving uh, the, that's the majority of the compute is what they're saying here. The square is just supposed to say square in the set of these things. So WR, WK, WV, WO. Uh, assuming B sequences, T maximum tokens and D channels. So we're getting a little bit more definitions here. T maximum tokens and D channels. Meanwhile, oh, shit. Oh, okay, there we go. Updating attention scores, WKV, requires a serial scan and has complexity O, B, T, D. Wouldn't this be smaller? This is a lower complexity than this. The matrix multiplications can be parallelized akin to WQKVO in a typical transformer. The element-wise WKV computation is time-dependent but can be readily parallelized along the other two dimensions. So the other two dimensions are the channel dimension and then I guess the, the head, number of heads. Token shift is implemented as a simple offset in the temporal dimension at each block using PyTorch. Yeah, this is the type of shit that like makes this difficult to understand, right? Where we're like, what the, what, why are they using this weird token shift? Like, how does this make any sense? This linear interpolating interpolation between the current input and the previous input, like, why are they doing that? And the reason they're doing that is because in PyTorch, you can basically shift these matrix like this with zero pad 2D, where you're basically just shifting it and then padding it with zeros. And this operation is probably very fast and you can probably do it in place or something like that, right? And so that on the GPU, you no longer need to uh, store uh, previous things in uh, the RAM and then send them back to the GPU, right? So if you were just to take this and then send it to the next time step, you would have to basically store this on the RAM probably, the, the activations of the previous step, and then send them back to the GPU, some kind of thing like that. So by doing this token shift, you can do it probably within the GPU cache. I don't know. I'm kind of like talking out of my ass a little bit here. Like I'm not, I don't write CUDA kernels, you know, I don't know the difference between the different caches in a GPU, but 
this guy definitely does. Whoever wrote this part here, whoever came up with this, I think the main dude was this Bopang dude. He definitely, he thought about this. He's he's the type of motherfucker that can think in six dimensions. You know, he can sit there and think about like how a six dimensional tensor is being multiplied with another six dimensional tensor on a GPU in parallel. And he's like, wait a second. If we do this, it'll be faster. You know, <laughs> I'm just a simpleton, you know? <laughs> Uh, it's not faster in training, it is fast and scalable. Other two dimensions. Still trying to figure out how the channel mixing can be done in parallel across time steps. It seems like they need the value from the previous time step. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I've worked at fancy places and I have, like, credentials from fancy universities, but, like, the secret is I'm an idiot. That's, you know what I'm saying? Like, I've been in a lot of rooms and a lot of times I'm the stupidest person in the room, you know? So, I don't know. My my uh, superpower is that I can just grind more than people, you know? I can, like, I can work harder than people, but, like, my entire career I've been in plenty of rooms where, like, the these motherfuckers are just so smart. You know, they're just so much smarter. And I'm just like, dude, how do you how do you do this in your head? But hey, you know, that's why that's what that's what humans that's what's beautiful about humanity, you know, is that there's people that are really, really smart and we get to benefit and we get to have cool AGI and not really understand exactly why they're doing this token shift. Okay. Poison. Still trying to figure out how the channel mixing can be done in parallel. So the channel mixing requires R and K and V. What does this mean? K, V? K goes into V? And then here you have the element wise. This is probably the, this little X here probably refers to this dot here, the element wise. And then here you have the concatenation with the previous one. Here you have the actual uh, softmax to get the probability distribution over all possible tokens. Right. So the output of this is a probability distribution over all possible tokens, and then you pick the token that you want and that you say is the next one. And delete this. RNN-like sequential decoding. It is common in recurrent networks to use output as state t in input as state t minus 1. This is especially evidence in the autoregressive decoding inference of a language model. Yeah, and transformers have to do this as well, unfortunately. Transformers, when you train, you can do it in parallel. But when you're doing inference, ChatGPT needs to know what the previous word that it told you before it can calculate the next word, right? This, this autoregressive kind of problem where you have to basically each token to be computed before it's fed into the next step. Making it possible to for RWKV to take advantage of its RNN-like structure, referred to as a time sequential mode. In such circumstances, RWKV can be conveniently formulated recursively for decoding during inference. I mean, that seems like it's just kind of the standard behavior, which leverages the advantage that each output token is dependent on only the latest state, which is of constant size irrespective of the sequence length. So this is more uh, I think this to me is is the is the 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 intuitively why RNNs are just so much better than transformers, where for transformers, when you're, calculating what the next token is going to be, you need to still have the entire sequence fed into the transformer, right? It's like everything from all the way to the beginning of the sequence is fed into the transformer in order just to calculate that very last token, the next token, right? But with a recurrent neural network, all of that information of the sequence is now compressed into a little vector which is supposed to represent everything that you've ever looked at beforehand, right? So that little vector could represent three words if you're the fourth word in the sequence, or it could, rec it could represent a whole book if you, if you fed this uh, model an entire book. So 
that's simultaneously the advantage and the the disadvantage is that that little vector that gets passed on to the next uh, that little state that gets passed on to the next state needs to somehow be able to store information from three words and information from a million words right and of course intuitively it makes sense that it's not going to be very good at storing the information from a million words at some point you're going to it's it's going to be like a lossy form of compression where it's like you just literally can't fit any more information into this little vector that gets passed on to the next state which was always been the problem of recurrent neural networks is that they just they lose information over time right because it's just like you're fundamentally limited by how much information you can really fit in that inside that little state that gets passed along the advantage of that is that if you're doing inference on a very tiny computer, you have a very limited amount of budget, you always know exactly uh, the the size of that vector that's going to get that you need from the previous state. So you don't need to constantly keep uh, using the whole sequence. But uh, okay, it then behaves as an RNN decoder, yielding constant speed and memory footprint with respect to the sequence length. Right enabling the processing of longer sequences more efficiently. In contrast, self-attention typically requires a KV cache. So what does this mean? Uh, KV cache refers to that whenever you're doing the uh, attention mechanism, right, you're feeding in the whole sequence, but you're not actually going to do that every single time. You're What you're typically going to do is you're going to cache the keys and the values, right? And that'll, that means that you don't have to do that one uh, multiplication again, but it means that you're now trading off time complexity for uh, memory complexity, space complexity. And that's usually the case for a lot of algorithms. So in a lot of kind of leak code problems or these kind of like interview problems, usually there's a trade-off, right? Usually there's some implementations that uh, will increase the speed or will make it faster, will make it a lower time complexity, but they increase the space complexity, right? you have to store intermediate values inside a dictionary or something like that, right? So there's a similar kind of situation happening here with transformers where you save yourself some computation in time by having this KV cache, but now you have this fucking KV cache that you have to keep track of, and depending on how long your sequence is, now you might be limited by memory as opposed to time. So there's constantly this trade-off of memory and or space and time complexity in algorithms. Uh, growing linearly with respect to the sequence length, resulting in degraded efficiency and increasing memory footprint as the time sequence grows longer. Wonder what RWKV's perplexity would be for next token prediction on this paper. <laughs> I think I'd still be way more perplexed. Yeah, I wonder if it's already read this uh, here. Uh... So receptance weight key value. Let's see if ChatGPT knows that. Uh, Chat.openai. Let's go to new chat. GPT-4. Let's do uh, what is a RWKV Jesus. I need to increase my scroll. What do the RW, the RWKV uh, letters stand for in a RNN model? Let's see if it knows. I'm trying to see if it gets the receptance. RWKV does not have a standard meaning. Okay, so ChatGPT does not know about it. Let's see if Bard knows about it. receptance weighted key value so look at that this is the advantage of bard like i've been using this more and more guys like i used to use chat gpt pretty much exclusively but now i use both of them just because like gpt is not doesn't have any recent information so if you're doing anything that it's like recent bard is better so interesting there uh, all right back to it what do we got software implementation 
RWKV is originally implemented using the PyTorch Deep Learning Library and a custom CUDA kernel for the WKV computation. Okay, so this WKV here, WKVT, which is their variant of the linear attention, they have their own CUDA kernel for it, right? So anytime you write Python code for a machine learning, really what that Python code is corresponding to is that you're going to have this kind of compilation step that's going to compile that down into actually CUDA kernels. And the CUDA kernel is the actual code that runs on your GPU. And this mapping of a Python function or some kind of functionality in Python into a CUDA kernel is very intense. There's a lot of kind of hardcore, like hidden arcane knowledge that goes into that. So writing your own custom CUDA kernel is some, like you, you have to make a pact with the devil in order to do that. Although RWKV is a general recurrent network, its current implementation focuses on the task of language modeling. The model architecture is comprised of an embedding layer for which we follow the setup described in section 4.7 and several identical residual blocks applied sequentially. After the last block, a simple output projection head composed by a layer norm and a linear projection is used to obtain the logits to be used in the next token prediction task. Okay. And calculate the cross entropy, cross entropy loss during training. So cross entropy loss is used for logits, which represent a probability distribution over a set of tokens. Both the embeddings generated after the last residual block and the logits could also be used later for downstream NLP tasks. Training is performed in time parallel mode while autoregressive inference and potential chat infer interface leverages time sequential mode. Yeah, so the big benefit here is that this is a RNN model that you can train in time parallel or that you can train in parallel. But then once you're doing inference, you're going to have to do it one time at a step or one step at a time, AKA sequentially, AKA serially. This is kind of interesting. They basically just described this here. Gradient scalability, stability, and layer stacking. The RWKV architecture has been designed as a fusion of both transformers and RNNs, offering the advantage of stable gradients and deep architectures of the transformer compared to traditional RNNs while being efficient in inference. Does it have stable gradients? Previous work has sought to tackle the problem of gradient stability with a variety of techniques, including non-saturated activation functions, gating mechanism, gradient clipping, and additional constraints. While these techniques have little success, RWKV avoids the problem inherently by utilizing softmax in conjunction with RNN-style updates. So in RNNs, there's also this channel mixing happening, but using gates. The main downside is that the gates use hidden states as in, an input data to compute their value. So to compute the gate value at time step t, you have to compute all hidden states up until t minus one, which is not parallelizable. But in RWKV, those gate values are not data dependent. Formula 10. You don't have to recompute previous hidden states to compute gate value at time step t. You simply compute it using a formula and a trained weight. So you're saying the fact that this here, sigma rt, is only dependent on rt, which means that it's, I mean, I don't know. It seems here like this forget gate, the sigma rt is dependent on rt, and rt is dependent on T minus one. It's all good. I appreciate I appreciate the explanations, you know. It's very interesting that not data dependent gates are actually working so well. Like RNN gates kind of decide if info is worth by looking at the actual data. Yeah, so what is basically you're saying kind of a lot of it comes down to like what are you using for this forget gate here? Right, like here, the what is actually what are you learning there if you're not using previous data? Uh, 
a single step process for updating attention like scores, which causes a time independent time dependent softmax operation that helps numerical stability and guards against vanishing gradients. Single step process for updating attention like scores. which includes a time-dependent softmax operation that helps numerical stability and guards against vanishing gradients. What? Time-dependent softmax? A softmax that is dependent on time? What? This operation ensures the gradient is propagated across, along the most relevant path Layer normalization is another key aspect of the architecture which enhances the training dynamics of deep by stabilizing gradients. Okay, so how does layer normalization uh, improve vanishing and exploding gradients? Because you basically normalize at every step. So as your gradients go down, through the layers normally they can become smaller and smaller and smaller you're multiplying smaller numbers by smaller numbers and that is the vanishing problem and then multiplying bigger numbers by bigger numbers that's the exploding problem so by normalizing it at every uh layer like that you're basically bringing them back to something similar right so you're only multiplying 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 or 0 0.99 times 0 0.99 right rather than multiplying 0 0.00001 by 0 0.00001 and so on Nice to catch you live. Enjoying your content. Keep up. I appreciate it. Wash too hot. Uh, unfortunately, this paper is kicking my ass. It's very dense, very intense. These design elements not only contribute to the RWKV's architecture stability and learning capabilities, but enable the stacking of multiple layers in a manner that surpasses the capabilities of any existing RNN. In doing so, the model is able to capture more complex patterns across various levels of abstraction. I feel like RNNs were stackable before, right? You could stack RNNs, right? Let's ask. Are RNNs stackable? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're stacking. Or, I'm talking about the... Yeah, you could have multiple RNN kind of heads, like kind of the equivalent thing, like have like a kind of like a channel dimension for those. So I don't know what they mean. Enable the stacking of multiple layers. Hmm. Harnessing temporal structure for sequential data processing. RWKV captures and propagates sequential information through the combination of three mechanisms, recurrence, time decay, and token shift. So recurrence which is basically just looking at your previous output, time decay, which is this forget kind of mechanism where you kind of slowly uh, over time remove some of the information in that vector, in that state that you're passing into the next thing, so you kind of forget things. And then token shift, which is this interpolation that they're doing between the tokens now and the tokens uh, at the next step. The token shift still makes absolutely no fucking sense to me. Like, what exactly is that doing? The recurrence in the time mixing block of RWKV is the basis for the model's capacity to capture intricate relationships between sequence elements and to propagate locality information through time. Capture intricate relationships between sequence elements. I feel like any, any sequence-based model that's what it's fundamentally doing is capturing relationships between different elements of the sequence so I don't know if that's unique to RWKV any any sequence based model is going to do that propagate locality information through time again I feel like 
any sequence model is doing that to some degree. Time decay mechanism e to the negative w and e to the u in equation 14 maintains sensitivity to the positional relationship between sequence elements. By gradually diminishing the influence of past information over time, the model preserves a sense of temporal locality and progression. Yeah, I still feel like this is like maybe not necessarily a good prior. Like the I guess that's what the whole point of this uh forget gate is is that it makes sure that important things are still there even if they're for farther away in time. The treatment of positional information in sequential data exhibits similarities to the attention with linear biases where linear biases facilitate input length extrapolation. In this, contest, the R, in this context, the RWKV architecture can be perceived as a trainable version of alibi, seamlessly incorporating positional information without the necessity for explicit encoding. So here they're kind of uh, shitting on explicit positional encoders. A lot of times positional encoders are used they're using transformers, for example, to let the transformer know where in the sequence that particular token is. You know, it's very common. There's different types of positional encoders. But here they're saying that the time decay kind of lets you know where in the sequence it is. So actually the time decay, you can almost see it more like a positional encoding. That's kind of a cool way to think about it. It can also be seen as an extension of the gated convolution. The token shift or time shift mixing also contributes to the model's adaptation to sequential data. By linearly interpolating between the current input and the previous time step input, the model naturally aggregates and gates information in the input channels. Oh shit. Cause uh okay. You just have to show tell me how it's like a convnet and now it makes so much more sense. By linearly interpolating between the current input and the previous time step, the now the model aggregates and gates information. I'm like, okay, well that doesn't make any sense. And then they're like, it resembles a convolution. And I'm like, shit, dude, that's what a convolution is doing. Right, like fundamentally, what is a convolution doing? Is it's basically blending in a little uh, window of things. So interpolating between two things, it's like you're almost convolving between the current step and the previous step. So this time shift is almost a convolution in the token space, aka a token shift. I just feel like the word shift there is the is the biggest problem. Is the word shift make com, like confuse me because I was like, what do, what does that even mean? But token interpolation, you can also call this token convolution with a kernel size of two and a stride of one. Just determined to learn in this stuff, experiencing the process through trying to read ML papers. I learned a lot. Glad I can help, man. Token shift is implementation detail they should have avoided. If you look at formula 1113, there is an X, T minus one. They just need to access data from the previous time step. <laughs> yeah. Right here, X, T, and then X, T minus one. Additional optimization, custom kernels. To address inefficiencies in the WKV computation due to the sequential nature of the task when using standard deep learning frameworks, we implemented a custom CUDA kernel so as to launch a single compute kernel in training accelerators. This is, this to me is like the hardest point of all of this, right? And this to me is also the biggest, the biggest thing in all of it, right? Is that there's kind of a, there's this saying in, in English, they call it the, the tail wags the dog, right? And Sometimes people come up with machine learning algorithms kind of head first, right? They think about the way that the math should make sense. And then from the math, they write that into Python. And then the Python gets compiled down into CUDA kernels. And then that runs on a GPU, right? 
but there's people who can think the opposite way. They can think in terms of the CUDA kernel that they want and then go upwards and then see what ends up happening. And I feel like that is the magic of this thing here, right? This RWKV is that the person probably when they were thinking about this, right? They thought about, oh, wait, you can actually make, write this in, in a CUDA kernel format that is really fast. And if you try to just naively take this WKV and, and do it, it's going to be very, very slow. And maybe that's what was limiting this, this this entire time is that jump from, hey, this WKV computation can be done in a custom CUDA kernel much in a that's much faster, much more parallel. So, you know, how many other people came up with this from a kind of more theoretical background and they wrote this in Python and then it was slow as shit and they were like, well, shit, I guess it's slow as fuck. There's no way I'm going to use this. But the, the ability to be able to write this as a custom CUDA kernel is huge. Uh, feed forward network with a R gate. Uh, prior research suggests that self attention may not be as essential in transformer based vision tasks as previously thought. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, it provides us with some insights. Replacing self attention entirely in natural language tasks could be too drastic. Uh, in our study, we partially dismantle the attention mechanism by replacing the fixed QKV with a KV and introducing a new time decaying factor, W. This approach enables us to incorporate token and channel mixing components akin to an MLP mixer. This actually is a nice little summary of like why this works, right? Is that basically the Q is a query vector and normally you would have to calculate that and that's going to change at every single token or at every single token in the sequence, but they're replacing the Q with this scalar W, right? This time decay factor. So that's kind of where you're getting a lot of that uh, computational efficiency there is that you don't no longer have to use these Qs, which are going to depend on each token, have to calculate them for each token. This approach enables us to incorporate token and channel mixing components akin to an MLP mixer and gating units R similar to the GMLP, which emulate the performance or enhance the performance of our RWKV model. Okay. Small init embedding. During the initial stages of training a transformer model, we observe that the embedding matrix undergoes slow changes, which pose a challenge for the model to deviate from its initial noisy embedding state. The embedding matrix undergoes slow changes. So basically the, they can't get this embedding matrix to change, which I guess is, where's the embedding matrix right here? It's whatever comes out of here, input embedding. To mitigate this issue, we propose an approach that involves initializing the embedding matrix with small values and subsequently applying an additional layer norm operation. By implementing this technique, we accelerate and stabilize the training process, enabling the training of deep architectures with post layer norm components. The effectiveness of this approach is demonstrated in figure eight, where it is shown to facilitate improved convergence by allowing the model to quickly transition away from the initially small embedding. This is achieved through small changes following a single step, which in turn lead to substantial alterations and directions and subsequently significant changes after the layer norm operation. What do they mean by small here? Small in magnitude or the, dim the dimensionality of this is gonna be the same. All those models try to transform e to the qk into e to the something plus something so that it can be e to the something times e to the something. Yeah. So TLDR for this entire paper is that e to the something plus something is faster than e to the something times something. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, building on principles from previous works, we initialize parameters to values as similar as possible to an identity mapping while breaking symmetry so there's a clean information path. Most weights are initialized to zero. No biases are used for linear layers. Nobody likes biases anymore. 
It would get rid of the biases, just extra complication. No one cares. They barely do anything. Uh, most weights are initialized to zero. That's kind of uncommon, but that's something you see in the, I think the LoRa paper or ControlNet paper also did this. They also started at zero initialization. We find the choice of initialization to be significant in convergence speed and quality. e to the something plus something is faster than e to the something times something. Factorial. Uh, we focus on evaluating to answer the following questions. RQ1, is RWKV competitive against quadratic transformers? Okay. Is increasing the number of parameters, <laughs> does RWKV remain competitive? Okay, so does it have the same scaling laws? Does increasing parameters yield better language modeling loss when RWKV token models are trained for context lengths that most open source quadratic transformers cannot efficiently process? Okay, so does it work about as good as transformers? Does it have the same scaling properties as transformers? And if you increase the context length, does it actually still work or is it just become nonsense? So those are the three questions they're trying to answer here. Uh, they're going to compare to, or they're going to compare on these benchmarks. So these are a couple different benchmarks against major open source quadratic complexity transformers. So Pythia, OPT, Bloom. Damn, they don't compare to Palm or GPT or any of those. That's unfortunate. But I guess they're only comparing against to open source models. So maybe. In a way, they're they're kind of making a political statement here by only comparing to open source models and not comparing to the Palm and GPT models. Shows that increasing the context length leads to toward lower test loss on the pile. This is the big data set that we saw. And indication that RWKV can make effective use of long contextual information. Yeah, so Figure five, where's figure five? Dude, what? Figure six is before figure four? Figure four, figure five, and then figure six? That's weird. Uh, let's actually see. Figure four, zero shot performance. The horizontal axis is a number of parameters and the vertical axis is accuracy. So. Here's the number of parameters of the actual model. So obviously bigger models are generally going to do better and that's known as this kind of scaling law. So, and then here on the Y axis, you have accuracy. So obviously the small version of Bloom is going to not perform as well as the big version of Bloom. And kind of what they're trying to show you here is that RWKV has the same properties where as you make it bigger, the accuracy improves. Okay, so it's on trend with the other uh, language models. Figure five, increasing the context length contributes to lower test loss on the pile. So test loss is basically how good it can predict the next word, the next token, right? The loss function is basically uh, your ability to match the probably the your probability distribution over tokens to the actual token that it should be because you know what the answer is because that's what the pile is just a bunch of it's a big sequence of text and what they're saying here is that as you increase the context length the loss goes down it's an interesting choice to use the test loss as opposed to these benchmarks right because they're saying that hey it's getting better at uh, next token prediction whenever you increase the context length, but I bet you that it didn't actually get that much better in accuracy because for these types of uh, benchmarks here, whatever the ArcC and PsiQ, Winograd, you probably don't need that much context, right? The performance of Winograd is, is not necessarily going to be dependent on the context length because it's probably the questions are probably very small. But what we learned through GPT and all of that is that getting better at next token prediction in actually makes it better at benchmarks. So 
that's kind of what they're telling you here is that like, hey, the test loss is getting better. And even though nobody really gives a shit about next token prediction, next token prediction is actually a good proxy for the final performance on benchmark. So even though the accuracy on these benchmarks probably didn't improve impressively enough for us to show it, we're letting you know that it's probably in more, it's probably getting more intelligent. Okay, let's get back up here. Uh, inter inference experiments. We benchmark inference requirements according to the size and family. Specifically, we evaluate text generation speed and memory requirements on a typical compute platform. So this is time complexity, Ooh. time complexity, and this is space complexity. Uh, Cross 86 CPU, and then an NVIDIA A100 with 80 gigabytes of RAM. We, in all of experiments, we use float32 precision. Okay, so, I mean, from their GitHub, we know they have better than that. We know that they have int4, int8, and floating point 16. So they're really only doing the experiments on the biggest uh, data type here, the 32-bit floating point. So the 30, floating point 32 is actually going to give you the biggest or the best accuracy, but it's going to give you the slowest uh, speed in terms of inference and memory. Uh, so it's going to be even faster than what they're advertising here, basically. We include all model parameters and parameter count, including both embedding and non-embedding layers. Performance under different quantization setups is left for future work. Uh, see Appendix 1 for more results. Okay, so CUDA Facebook OPT 2.7b, CUDA Eleuther AI Pythia 2.8b. These are other models here. So this is a 2.8 billion parameter size model, the Pythia model. These are all very small little models, little 3-bill, three 3-bill, three 2-bill. But, I mean, this picture speaks a thousand words. Look at this. Look at the uh, number of tokens. So this is basically, you can think of tokens as words, even though they're usually little chunks of words. And the cumulative GPU time required to generate that. And you can see how all of these other models are transformers, so they're quadratic in the attention, right? So what that means is that in order to generate token number 401, you need to, you need to basically do attention with 400 tokens. So in order to calculate the 801 token, you need to do attention with all 800 tokens. So you can see how it has this quadratic relationship. But that is not the case for RWKV because RWKV doesn't give a shit. It's saying to calculate the 400th token, I just need whatever the hidden state is at 399, which is exactly the same at 1000, which is if I need want to calculate the 1001th token, I just need whatever the previous state was, right? So this is linear. This is, a, this is a beautiful chart here. Uh, additionally, we carried out comparative studies on w, RWKV4 and ChatGPT and GPT-4. Okay, so they did do some. That's kind of cool. Appendix J. So <laughs> we're already at, we're on page 7, and they've already mentioned the appendix 10 times, so I feel like the appendix for this paper is going to be bigger than the paper for sure. Uh, RWKV4 is very sensitive to prompt engineering. That's not good. When prompts were adjusted, and why would that make sense? Actually, that makes a ton of sense, right? Because uh, quadratic attention transformer models, they look at the entire sequence, right? So every part of the sequence pays attention to every part, every other part of the sequence. So it means that it doesn't really like the the spacing or the words it's the the way that you put the words it doesn't really matter because the all of them are going to look at all of them right let's say if you uh switch some of these words here like you put the word sent up here and the word which down there it would still have the ability for everything to pay attention to everything so it doesn't really matter but in this rwkv model because it's it's not it, it, it doesn't have the, the full sequence anymore, right? It's basically passing forward this little vector that's supposed to represent everything beforehand. So 
it makes sense that if you mess around with the with the prompt and you change different things, you're going to get fundamentally different little vectors, and then that's going to give you very different behavior. So this is actually a potential huge Achilles heel, right? Sure, RWK v4 might be fast, and it might be you might be able to get these fast tokens and all this stuff that they're kind of talking about, but how sensitive? is it to prompt engineering? Is it sensitive to the point that it's like borderline unusable? You know, this could be a huge problem. Uh, prompts were adjusted to more suitable. The F1 measure performance increased. Like, damn, look at that. Just with prompt engineering, you can get like a 30% performance boost. So I don't know, maybe the prompt engineering job is is the future, you know? People were memeing on the prompt engineering job because, of course, prompt engineering will kind of disappear as these models get better. But I don't know, if, if we end up adopting these uh, recurrent models, maybe prompt engineering makes a comeback and it continues to be super important. There are several promising directions for future work, increasing model expressivity and the enhanced time decay formulations. Yeah. Uh, so this is one thing that I generally didn't like about this paper, the weird time decay that's like hard-coded. So enhancing that in some way, finding some better prior for it. Further improving RWKV computational efficiency by applying parallel scan in the WKVT step to reduce the computational cost to B log T of D. Okay, so there's more juice to be squeezed in the CUDA kernel implementation of this WKV step. Investigating the application of RWKV to the encoder decoder architectures and potential replacement of cross attention mechanism. So encoder decoder architecture, uh, whenever you're looking at an attention, this is the encoder here. And then this is the decoder. So this was originally designed for translation, and in translation you encode the stuff, the sequence in one language, and then you're basically using that to decode uh, the sequence in the new language that you want. And the cross attention refers to this, the fact that here you're doing attention with the, the uh, values, I think. I think it's the Q, K, and then V or the key and values are produced by the encoder. So the key and the values are coming out of here, out of this uh, uh, encoder here, and then the queries are coming out of the uh, decoder. So this part, this little section here is what's called cross attention. So here they're saying, hey, is there some way to get rid of this cross attention? Or could we figure out a way to basically do an RWKV that has this kind of cross attention encoder decoder kind of style? And if you can do that, once you have kind of encoder decoder, now you can do uh, different tasks such as sequence to sequence or multimodal or whatever you want, right? The way that this is written right now, it's basically just predicting next token. It's like an RNN. It's great. You can use RNNs for all kinds of things, but uh, for example, translating, it wouldn't really work for that. You would need an encoder decoder to do translation. Leveraging RWKV state or context for interpretability, predictability, and sequence data and safety. So this is the uh, the little vector that gets passed from one step to the next step, right? The whole recurrent part of it is this little state or context. I sometimes call it the hidden state. Um, but they're saying, what if you could look at that, right? What if you could look at that little vector and use it to, to kind of have a better understanding of what exactly is happening, right? It's a lot more difficult to look at this giant attention matrix and be like, okay, well, what is this model actually thinking about, right? You look at this giant attention matrix and you're like, well, I don't know. What the fuck does that mean, right? But maybe if you have a little vector and it's always the same size vector, maybe that'll be a little bit more predictable, a little bit more interpretable. So I could see that. That's kind of a cool idea. Manipulating this hidden state could also guide behavior. Maybe you could have almost like a conditioning vector that you basically add to this hidden state. But I don't know, I feel like 
The problem with this is that if your sequence length gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that there's so much information that's packed into that little hidden state that I feel like if you try to manipulate it, you're just going to completely fuck with everything. You know, it's like the hidden state, because it has to encode so much information inside that little vector, I feel like it's going to be super fragile and you're not going to be able to really do anything with it without drastically just like kind of altering the information that's in there. Exploring fine-tuned methods and specific settings for enhanced interaction with humans. Okay, so I'm sure, I think they actually were talking about that too, but you can do uh, low rank, lower fine-tuning for this as well. So this is somebody who made that. Bleel tan. Bleel tan. I don't know, but here you are. Here's a Laura fine tune for this model. Uh, adapting parameter efficient fine tuning, such as Laura. Okay, well, there you go. That <laughs> they already have that. So there it is. And different quantization. So, right, you want to be able to run this at lower precision data types, so that you can run it on smaller compute packages such as edge devices, right? Everybody wants to be able to run an LLM on a phone or a Raspberry Pi. So quantization is the path to that. Conclusions. We introduced RWKV, a new approach to RNN models exploring the potential of time-based mixing components. RWKV introduces several key strategies which allow it to capture locality and long-range dependencies. Locality means uh, local, right, like small, like things that are close together in the sentence, right, and then long range dependencies refers to like uh, longer sequences. You might have some information that's very far away from the information that uh, you currently have, but they're they're still dependent on each other, right? There's still some 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 knowledge there that you would want to to be able to capture. While addressing limitations of current architectures by replacing the quadratic QK attention by a scalar formulation with linear cost, that's really the biggest part, and reformulating recurrence and sequential inductive biases to unlock efficient training parallelization and efficient inference. Uh, I don't know if efficient inference is the right word. I think in inference is always shitty no matter what you're doing. And three, enhancing training dynamics using custom initialization. Yeah, so this is kind of a throwaway, the, this last little part that they said here, but that's not, you know, it's not it's not negligible. Like, the fact here that they're like, oh, yeah, we uh, initialized it to zero and, and used no biases and it kind of worked way better, right? Like, they could have not done that. They could have not done that and they would have, they could have used, like, whatever generic, like, savior initialization and then it just never really worked and they're like, I guess this idea is trash but they had the idea of initializing it to zero and then that worked way better. So in a lot of these papers, it's like, there's always like, there's like random little trick that makes it 10 times better. And you think about how many other random papers that people have published, there's just one little trick. And if you just figure out that one little trick, the, the actual paper would be way better. So I don't know, maybe we haven't fully explored uh, model architecture space enough, right? I think there's some people that say that model architecture space is over you know, it's transformers forever. And any time you spend trying to mess with the model architecture is a waste of time. Just spend your time trying to clean the data because transformers are king. But I think this paper kind of shows you that maybe there's still something there. Maybe there's still, it's still worth trying to think about different types of model architectures and uh, how you can improve just by changing those things. Show comparable performance to state of the art. Further experiments on expressivity, interpretability, and scaling showcase the model's capability to draw parallels in behaviors between RWKV and other LLMs. RWKV opens a new door to scalable and efficient architectures to model complex relationships and sequential data. While many alternatives to transformers have been proposed with similar claims, ours is the first to back up those claims with pre-trained models and tens of billions of parameters. Back the fuck up, dudes. You guys are going around trying to tell each other that you have the best transformer? Nah, dude, we have the best transformer. We backed up those claims. All right, limitations. Demonstrated some limitations. First, the linear attention leads to significant efficiency gains, but also may limit the perf model's performance on tasks that require, require recalling minutiae information over very long contexts. Yeah, this is the problem, is that by 
continuously compressing information into this little hidden vector, you basically lose potentially important information that's very small. Uh, this is due to the funneling of information through a single vector representation over many time steps compared with the full information maintained by the quadratic attention of standard transformers. So in a standard transformer, every part of the input sequence has the opportunity to, to contribute to the current sequence prediction or the current token prediction. So you maintain that information. You're not doing this kind of like lossy compression. In other words, the model's recurrent architecture inherently limits its ability to look back at previous tokens as opposed to traditional self-attention mechanisms. While learned time decay helps prevent the loss of information, it is mechanic me mechanistically limited. Yeah. Another limitation of this work is the increased importance of prompt engineering. They're kind of hiding this, right? It's like they, they only mentioned this twice, but it seems like it could be a huge problem. Limits the information from the prompt that will be carried over to the model's continuation. Carefully designed prompts may be even more crucial for the model to perform well. We acknowledge eLuther AI and Stability AI for compute access and technical support. We also acknowledge the members of RWKV Discord server for their help and work on further extending the applicability of RWKV to different domains. Pretty cool. Let's keep going. Let's go straight into the appendices here. This is all the people that did all the different things. Bo Peng is the original idea, the original code. Did all the original training. Eric Alcade is the person who wrote the paper, basically. I guess this guy also wrote the paper also wrote the paper, also wrote the paper. So really it's just this guy did all the work and then everybody else just wrote the paper. Manuscript, 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 manuscript. Manuscript, manuscript. Yeah. Time mixing block as an RNN cell. Okay, let's see if we get a little bit better explanations here in the appendices. So finally, okay, they show us the LSTM here. Or this is not actually an LSTM, never mind. This is slightly different, you can tell. See, this is the LSTM cell, looks slightly different from this one. Uh, hidden state at T minus one. Input at T minus one, so, or output, right? So current input, previous input, here you have X of T gets passed in to the next one. Yellow the notes, the token shift. Finally, finally, <laughs> this entire paper, we were like, what is this mu? And now we know what it is. It's a token shift. It's basically you take X T and you take X T minus one and you linearly interpolate between them. And then there you go. That's your little token shift. Jesus, it took it took, what is that? It took like two and a half hours for us to finally understand what the fuck this mu was. And it's just the token shift. All right. So you take that, you have your keys, you have your uh, values, and you have your forget gate here. Here's your little forget gate. Your little forget gate is taking, uh, you have your, here you have, what is this E? Red denotes the denominator. Blue denotes the numerator. Okay, so this is the denominator and numerator. So that's what these two are here, one and two. Where the hidden state H is the numerator denominator tuple. So H is actually two different things. H is a tuple of things, it's A and B. A, T, B, T. Here's your sum u plus kt and because you're doing that you can pull it out which is what they're doing here e to the negative w a t minus one so here's your previous numerator and then here's your previous denominator so the current numerator is the previous numerator times this uh the the weight here right which is supposed to represent 
uh, supposed to model the time decay. And then you have your standard uh, k times v here. Holy shit. Sorry, I'm like swearing all over the place. I don't know if you guys like that. Probably, you probably don't. Uh, the numerator pink denotes the fraction computations in 14. H denotes the numerator denominator tuple A, B. Okay, so here is the actual E to the KT times V of T. So E to the KT times V of T. This term here is this term here. So E to the KT times V of T. And that gives you 2. And then E to the KT gives you 1, which is red, which is denominator. So this over here, plus HT minus 1. Then you have your forget, your WKV here, which is the, the computation that they have the custom CUDA kernel for. You forget some parts of it, and then you get your output. Shouldn't this go here? I feel like this should go here. To avoid overflow in calculating e to the kt, a numerical trick is used in the official implementation. Note that a1 equals e to the negative wa0 plus e to the k0 v0, which equals e to the k0 v0. We set a1 prime equal v0 and b1 prime equals 1, where pt minus 1 stores the shared exponents of at and bt. Recursion can be converted into a numerically safe version. What is P of T? PT here. PT minus one U plus KT. They're they're re they're rewriting these equations with uh, Q and P here. And the reason they're doing that is because they want to show you that this WKV calculation is just A T over B T and you can and you can basically calculate these separately, right? So that's kind of by having this denominator and this numerator and denominator situation here, you can calculate these in parallel, which I think is the whole point, is that you can calculate A of T at the same time as you calculate B of T. Right, and only A of T is dependent on V of T. Down here in the B, you see how there's no V here. Shared exponent are carried out in a similar fashion. So Q is the max of PT minus 1 minus W and KT. And then A prime and B prime. So I'm looking at this here, PT minus 1 minus Q, and then here it's PT minus 1 minus W minus Q. Here you have u plus kt minus q, and then here you have kt minus q. What? So, I mean, this is hard because they don't really tell you what q means. They don't really tell you what p means. They still haven't told you what u is. So, a little bit unfortunate. You know, we've got a bunch of equations, but we don't know what all the variables mean. Parameter and flops, this is floating point operations, which is a general way to measure the uh, computation required by a machine learning system or a neural network system. Along with their respective parameters. So, 
you can see here the number of flops per token scales, I guess, linearly with the uh, size of the model. It's not quadratic, I guess. No, that's not what they're trying to say. I'm getting confused. <laughs> I guess what they're trying to show you here is that 169 mil to 14 bill, the number of flops per token isn't going to explode, right? It's basically linear with the amount of parameters. See that 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 8th here, 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 10th. The number of parameters for each model is computed using the formula 2VD plus 13D squared L plus D11L plus 4. Oh shit, dude, their vocabulary size is 50,000? That's different. The token uh, vocabulary very size uh, for sentence piece, I think. Yeah, that's so vocabulary size is basically the number of different tokens that you can possibly output, the number of tokens that you need to represent every single piece in your sequence. And normally it's like 32,000 is the one that I think most use, which is sentence piece or word piece tokenizers. But here the vocabulary is 50,000, which is kind of intense. That's, that's unusual, right? Because that's also gonna increase your compute as well, right? Because now your probability distribution over all tokens has an X is basically almost twice as big. So I don't know, that's a little bit weird. I don't know why they picked such a large vocabulary. Flops is the forward pass. Eleuther AI, GPT, Neox has 50K tokens. What are, what are the extra 20K tokens? You know who might know this? GPT. Uh, some tokenizers have 32K to uh, vocabulary size, but others have 50K vocabulary size. What are those extra 20K tokens used for okay 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 fucking GPT-4 is so slow I'm gonna go to Bard tell me wider range of unique subwords Better handling of rare words, names, or specialized terminology. Different languages. So it's probably just like weird umlauts. Weird. Proper nouns, technical terms, words from other languages, words that are used infrequently. Yeah, so it's probably just like, I guess that's probably what it is. But I don't know, it seems like if you're trying to be fast and you're trying to kind of showcase how much faster your model is, right, you can actually cheat a little bit by having a smaller vocabulary size and that would make everything faster, so. RWKVK, oh, it's Chinese, Chinese characters. How many unique Chinese characters are there? Modern Dictionary has about 20,000. Educated Chinese, so it's basically 10,000 characters is roughly what you got. Yeah, so that, that, I feel like that seems on the right order of magnitude, so it's probably just English characters plus Chinese characters. Uh, flops is a forward pass for one token. It's noteworthy that flops are independent of context length. Alternative approximations for flops. So you can roughly calculate flops by doubling the parameters. 
Okay, that's kind of cool. Describe the specific parameter initializations. Embeddings are initialized to a uniform distribution with 1e to the negative 4 as the total variance, I guess. So very close to 0. The embeddings are all basically like numbers very close to 0. Uh, for the channel mixing blocks, mu of ki and then mu of ri. I don't know if this mu refers to the mean of the distributions used for the for the initialization or whether it refers to the uh, time shift. Wi, known as time decay, is initialized to this. It is the discount factor applied to previous tokens over time. Right. Ui, also known as a bonus. Finally, finally, we know what Ui means. It's a bonus. And what the fuck is this? It's a special weighting applied to the current token. Alternating zigzag pattern initially creates subtle variations in the tensor elements, which are intended to help the model treat different dimensions of the embedding distinctively. Almost, so it's like some kind of almost like a positional embedding, like a cosine position embedding. What does this even look like? Oh my god. Uh, one plus I mod three minus plus zero log. Let's go to Wolfram Alpha. I haven't used Wolfram Alpha in a very long time, so I might make myself look stupid here, but like uh plot f of x equals 0 0.5 times x plus 1 mod 3 minus 1 plus log of 0 0.3. What does this function actually look like? It doesn't like this. So the the Yeah, the problem is that mod three here is going to basically it's going to change. It's like integer division, right? So basically you're going to go and then boom, boom, and that's why they're saying the zigzag pattern, because that mod is gonna lead to basically like a linear thing and then it's gonna go flat down to a specific value and then linear, 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 flat down to a specific value. But Okay, I think it's also like this. Yeah, it's like this. Uh, I want to plot this function in uh, Wolfram. the percent is supposed to be a uh, mod, but it doesn't seem like the right character in Wolfram. Can you help me? Oh, the symbol for modulus operation in Wolfram language is percent or is mod not percent okay so really what we want is this there you go that's what we wanted okay so there's that zigzag pattern enlarge oh i need to pay money for <laughs> i need to give wolfram my money in order to enlarge that plot but largely this is what it looks like right you have this little zigzag uh, w naught, which is the time mixing, and then WV, which is the channel mixing, are initialized with a Gaussian 
distribution that is centered on zero and has a variance of the square root of d over s which this is like also really fucking weird like all these initializations are really obscure yeah i agree with you kalina that these are very heavily engineered and like not intuitive like it's very intense and then r k and v are all initialized to zero Dude, what? That is hardcore. I wonder if they got those theoretically, like they came up with these equations theoretically, or whether, whether these are experimentally determined, right? Did they try a bunch of these different uh, time decay and bonus terms and then f kind of ended up on this, or did they kind of intuitively pick these? Small in embeddings. All layer norm weights start from one and biases from zero, okay. Uh, experimental validation of small initialization embeddings. The experimental setup is as follows. In the baseline configuration, the parameters are initialized using a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 0 0.02. This is a commonly used initialization. Okay, so this one here, that's just, uh, they just took it from different papers. So probably in BERT and GPT, it was experimentally determined but here they just copied it from that. Uh, the parameters are initialized using a uniform distribution. This is the uniform plus minus 1e negative 4, which is slightly different from RWKV where a normal distribution with a standard deviation is used. Okay, so The, in the baseline, the initialization for the embeddings is a Gaussian, and that's what this blue line is. But then uh, they tried what they call small init embedding, and then that they switched it to a uniform distribution, which is in between 1e e to the negative 4 and negative 1e e to the negative 4, and it does actually seem to be better. I wonder if this is training loss or test loss, probably test loss. batch size of 400 gradient stability we present mathematical description of the gradient stability if the inputs xt are bounded and the model parameters are fixed then the gradients with respect to wk and wv are uniformly bounded for all t so this is the key point if the inputs are bounded so one way to ensure that the inputs are bounded is to layer norm them, right? You normalize them so you know that they're always going to be between. We can control the amount X, XT contributes to the gradient at T in a naturally decaying fashion by the weight decaying mechanism. First, we make the simplification that there are no token shifts. This will not affect the final conclusion. Okay, so the famous WKV operation, they can rewrite that as uh, this here, write the separating into the numerator denominator kind of thing. Have some partial derivatives here. These are the different keys. So this is the key matrix, and then you have different columns of that key matrix. The loss function. The loss function is your target at time step t, the token that you want at time step t, uh, and then whatever the uh, token that you predict with this WKV is. And the partial derivative of the loss function here, the, the reason they're doing that is because they're doing, uh, this is the chain rule here basically, where dLT dVW, so the partial derivative of this loss with respect to the weights in the, uh, the value weights, this weight matrix here, is the partial derivative of the loss with respect to this WKV times 
the partial derivative of the WKV with respect to the WV. So this is just chain rule here. And the reason that you want to do this is because you don't know what this is, but you do know what this is, right? That's what they're telling you here. The par This partial derivative is the partial derivative of this expected value, which is equivalent to this. Or no, 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 it's not even equivalent to that. What they're saying is that it can be bounded. So they say, okay, well, we know that this expected value here is at, the, the maximum value that that's going to be is going to be this, so therefore it's bounded, which means that I think the whole reason they're doing this is to uh, provide a theoretical proof for the gradient stability, right? They want to basically guarantee that you're not going to have exploding gradients or vanishing gradients. This is the uh, covariance, I think. Yeah, here's covariance. Oh my god, the highlighting is just so bad. Uh, note that WKV softmax contains at least two non-zero terms, U and W, so the above covariance will not degenerate into zero. Okay, so where is the U? I don't, know, I don't see a U in this, but they're basically saying that U and W are non-zero, so therefore this covariance will not become zero. Time decay sorted across the channel axis. Ooh, this is kind of cool. This is the layers of the network, right? And then it shows you how the time decay changes according to the channel. So in layer one, we have this this kind of thing here. The, the later channels heavily decayed, and the, imp, the first channels not decayed at all, right? So here, I think what this means here is that the information here is largely kept the same, but then as you go into these these kind of deeper, or not deeper, but like uh, further along channels, you can see how the information starts to become less and less important, or at least that's what this time decay variable or is supposed to do, this, this uh, W. Log probability of Paris. So, at the end of the day, what the model is trying to output is a log probability, or is a probability distribution over all possible tokens, right? So it's 50,000 numbers. It's 50,000 numbers where each of those numbers represents the probability of that specific word in the vocabulary of being the, the right next word, right? So in this sentence here, the Eiffel Tower is located in the city of, the correct word is Paris, right? So you can see exactly where uh, the, the, the kind of model is making its decision. And it's making it, as soon as you say the I full, boom. That's where, that's where really the path is. It's kind of cool. It's kind of interesting that the it doesn't happen until the last layer. Like, what are all these layers over here doing? Decay so monotonically with respect to the channel index. The channel index does not have any intrinsic meaning. Where does this monotonicity come from? So they do the channel mixing though, right? So, I don't know how the channel mixing affects this, right? Let's see, they explain it here, so let's see if they actually explain it. Present visualizations of some behaviors. The top plot indicates the time decays in each layer sorted along the channel axis. 
Notably, several decays in the last layer are very close to or equal to one, implying that certain information is preserved and propagated throughout the model's temporal context. Meanwhile, many decays in the initial layer are close to zero, which corresponds to local operations in WKV. Likely to be associated with tasks such as text parsing. Local operations in WKV is due to the extra parameter u when e negative w is degenerating to zero. These patterns of time decay are partly learned, but also come from parameter initialization. So maybe there's like some kind of notion of kind of hierarchy going on here. I don't know what they mean by sorted. You know, that's that's another thing. Like, I don't know if it literally is like these are unordered, right? It's like it, they're normally layer two doesn't actually mean exactly layer two. It's just kind of, or, you know what I'm saying? Like what? Does the word sorted mean that this is actually the way the information is or that they sorted it in order to make you make you see this plot? I don't know. I'm kind of I'm kind of with you, Kalina, where it's like it's kind of weird that you have this this consistent kind of meaning of the channel you know like normally the channel doesn't like in a convolution right the channels correspond to different feature maps but those feature maps don't follow like a specific pattern right it's like you might have a feature map that represents a dog's eye and then a dog's ear and like but here the channels seem to have this meaning in terms of like some channels are trying to capture longer range dependencies and other channels are trying to capture more short-term dependencies and the fact that this is somewhat learned is a little bit weird. Right, partially learned. So what does it look like before it's learned? That would be curious to see. It's like, I'd be curious to see what this looks like before it is learned. Like what, what do these plots look like at initialization? And then what do the plots look like at the end, right? I think that that would help for sure. Uh, run the model once, corrupt the embeddings, restore the states. Most of the information is propagated through time until reaching when is needed. Retrieved in layer four and then passed down to subsequent layers. This is weird. This is this like makes it sound like the model like stores the information in different channels depending on the time kind of horizon. It learns to store different things in different layers. Right? Because these different layers have a different relationship to the time decay. I don't know. All right, so here are all the different data sets that they use. Arc Easy, Head QA, MMLU, Record, PsyQ, OpenBook QA. Here you have all the different model sizes that they're using. 14B, 12B, 13B, 3B, 3 billion, 125 million. Missing models are in missing models in are due to out of memory errors. So I think they can't probably fit certain some of these models on their cards. Illustrates the results of time and memory requirements for LLM inference in Flow32 Precision. The infamous CUDA out of memory errors that everybody loves. Everybody loves those errors.
train, BPC, time complexity, space complexity. Peak memory in gigabytes for 512 tokens. So 512 length sequence using the biggest possible model of RWK for Pile CPU, you only need less than four gigabytes of GPU memory, which is fucking crazy. That's a tiny little GPU. And this is not even quantized. This is full float 32 precision. Peak memory in gigabytes for 512 tokens, excluding model parameters. CPU time. OPT CPU, Pythia CPU, RWK4 Pile CPU. This is kind of weird. Why is this not linear? This is quadratic. Right here, RDBK4. Hmm. All right. Importance of prompt constructions. Inspired by article, we compared the zero shot performance with ChatGPT and GPT-4. Each model got the same prompts manually chosen to receive proper responses. RWKV performs significantly worse than ChatGPT and GPT-4 in specific task performance. When the instruction style was adapted to respect that RNN is not capable for retrospective processing, quality over some data sets increased significantly. So they basically prompt engineered the benchmark and it performed much better. Having premise judge if the following hypotheses are logically connected to the premise. While separating the instruction from the input, other aspects of prompt engineering are harder to quantify. Testing the approach of stating the input after the question on multiple other tasks suggests that better prompts might reduce the disparity between models. What the fuck is unhealthy conversation detection <laughs> and sarcasm detection data set? <laughs> what? Prompt engineering seems to be significantly more important to RNN models compared to standard transformers. Maybe even chain of thought doesn't work as well. Yeah, interesting. The RNN model does not do well with chain of thought. Without chain of thought, outperform ChatGPT. It would not be surprising if, thanks to the hidden state, RNN models do not need additional steps during inference. Oh shit. Dude, what if what if all this chain of thought crap that we're doing now doesn't matter and it's actually we end up not needing it because everything ends up being based on RNNs and you don't want any kind of chain of thought because you're just adding extra crap to this hidden state. That's very interesting. It only makes the model forget information and analyzed. And yeah, with an RNN, the order of the information is going to be more important. Tell me about ravens. There's ravens in Australia? That's badass. They're pretty much everywhere.
It's like having a smart friend who always knows what to do. Oh shit. Below is the numerical numerical stable formula for updating the state variable in RWKV. Please write out the corresponding PyTorch code to do so. Here's the PyTorch code to update the state variable into RWKV. Import torch makes a function. This is really not a good way to do this, right? This is a very unreadable code here. These are all arguments. No quarks, no data types, no type hinting. The names are basically unreadable, but it's probably correct, or else they wouldn't have put it in this paper as an example. Here you have the uh, e to the u, which is the that weird like uh, sawtooth thing. K minus q times v. So this is the numerator. Here you have the denominator, no dependence on v. Here's a of t, and then here's should be a of t minus 1. I would have said a underscore t underscore uh, 1 or something like that. And then return a of t and b of t. Yeah, that's probably what I tried to do. It's picking random numbers to start. Life is like cats. Life can be unpredictable and full of unexpected turns, such as a cat behavior. Test the conversion of 2 to the negative i from 0 to infinity. So you're summing 2 to the negative 0, then 2 to the negative 1, then 2 to the negative 2, then 2 to the negative 3, and so on. Uh, this is a geometric series. The first term is 2, and the ratio is 1 half. The sum of the given series is 2. Sum of infinite series. I don't know if I've ever had to do that. I feel like I got taught that in school, and then it just disappeared in my brain. <laughs> I would like to cook some Chinese food. Stir fry. Pork belly. This paper represents a novel architecture receptance weighted key value that combines an efficient parallelizable Training of transformers with the efficient inference of RNNs, the model is able to scale to tens of billions of parameters and exhibits linear computational complexity during, okay. I saw on the RWKV Discord, people said that the model is surprisingly good at math. Yeah, I would almost, I would have intuited that it would be worse, right? Because the transformers, right? Like kind of like they were mentioning in this paper, it it's not it doesn't lose any information right like in the transformer let me see if i can pull it up every piece of the sequence is still there so if you have a very complicated math problem and you have like uh sally and bob and sally has three apples and bob has four oranges right like the transformer has all of the pieces of information there so all of those pieces of information there are still there in their unchanged way and you can use them for the final answer but something like this with an rnn it no longer has that information that Bob has three apples and uh, Sally has two oranges and whatever because it's that information has now been compressed in, in probably some kind of lossy way into the hidden vector. So that is kind of crazy that it can, it can be good at math because you would think that math is something where you need to have everything there in its original unadulterated form in order to be uh, good. Uh, but cool. All right, guys, we made it. How long, how long have we been streaming? It's 11.17, so roughly almost three hours at this point. But we did it. We got through all 25 pages of RWKV. Maybe high-level summary, RWKV is basically a transformer that uh, 
is more inspired by a recurrent neural network than a transformer. It still has uh, some of this, some of the similar parts, such as the key and the values here, but they replace this is the basically the key thing here. They replace this QT transpose KI with the WTI plus KI. They also have a couple weird things in here that, uh, such as this token shift. I'm, I'm going to be honest, I don't really fully understand everything. You know, lots of weirdness going on here, like squared ReLU, like why, you know? But the whole point is that uh, you can basically, at training time, you can do things in parallel, which means you can train this just as fast as a transformer. And then when you're uh, performing inference, you don't need the entire sequence. All you need is this uh, hidden state, right? This late this kind of like vector that gets passed around from state to state so that you can do inference uh, with significantly better uh, memory complexity. Uh, it potentially has issues with prompt engineering, right? The prompt, it's more sensitive to the prompt. And of course, it's going to over time forget things that are very far away. But it seems to scale just as good as these other transformer based models. It also seems to benefit and become better at next token prediction as the context length increases. And I think more important than any of that, more important than any of that is that this is popular, it looks popular, right? And I think in a lot of these things, like for example, uh, capsule nets is I think is a good example. Capsule nets, were like super hot for a little bit, right? We're basically, uh, I think it was, I forget exactly who proposed them, but but they were, these were like gonna replace ConfNets, right? Jeffrey Hinton, he came out with this, but no one, no one really, there wasn't really a good implementation of it. The code base sucked, it was slow, and no one ended up using them and they died, right? And that's largely what happened. And a lot of times people come up with these new model architectures and then just, the code base is not quite there. It doesn't work super well. And then nobody ends up using them. And then that's it, you know, and that's kind of the end of it. But when I look at this, I don't see that. I see a bunch of contributors. I see like a kind of like a lot of people working on this. You have a bunch of related repos where people are doing everything from quantization to a low rank uh, fine tuning. You have people implementing it in CUDA kernels, custom CUDA kernels specifically for this architecture. So there seems to be like a like a life to this, right? It doesn't seem like it's dead, and that's why I feel like maybe there's something here. So I don't know. I'm, I'll definitely keep checking these guys out. Uh, join their Discord. There's probably a bunch of smart people on there who can answer all your questions much better than I can. But yeah, it looks like it's alive, and I think that as long as they have money and as long as these people keep uh, pushing code, it seems like we're gonna get to see what happens and whether or not these end up being better than transformers in the long run. So, overall pretty cool. And yeah, this guy, badass dude, Peng Bo, absolute monster. Anybody who can do that type of math and also write CUDA kernels, it's few and far between. All right, that's it for me, guys. I'm going to go have some lunch. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Hopefully, you guys got something out of that. If not, I apologize. But if you did, uh, hit that like and subscribe and come join our Discord and see you guys tomorrow. I think tomorrow I have a, just a little bit of casual Friday chill programming. So we'll see what I'll do. I'll come up with some stuff. Um, but yeah, see you guys later.